Hey, good Thursday morning, everyone. We are on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with Jim Cramer to talk about the markets. And Jim, of course, we have Trump disbanding his CEO council. What do you think the impact will be for some of his market-friendly policies? Uh, none. I think that, uh, as, as Chuck Robbins, uh, the CEO of Cisco, was just saying to us, uh, th it's well known what the business people want. Uh, Congress knows what would help to get more money back, repatriation, what would make it so that more jobs could be, uh, be created, it, you don't need the council. Um, and, and that the council may not even, for me, be effective after what, uh, what occurred because there would be too many uh, CEOs who simply would not want to serve given the fact that, uh, the, that Trump defended a position that they that their stakeholders cannot abide by. You mentioned Chuck Robbins, that was a great interview. How do you now feel about the Cisco transition? See, you know, we sold the stock for action orders. We had a good gain hmm. and sold it above here. Uh, look, it, it yields 3.75. They are making a transition. They're doing well in the transition. Gross margins holding up, cash flow really good. Uh, but the problem is the optics. You still see the revenue numbers down. Uh, switching and routing are the biggest uh, division still, and the switching and routing are, are not being uh, as competitive as some others. I got that from Eric Johnson's amazing piece. If yes. you really want to know about what Cisco's doing, you'd read Eric Johnson. But I would say this. The deferred revenue is impressive. The software as a service model is happening. So it feels more like the way you have to measure these things is, is against the benchmark of Oracle. Oracle made a transition similar to what Cisco has. And it, it, you didn't know when you had to buy Oracle, but then Oracle did flip. But I still prefer Oracle to Cisco if you want to have a lower risk technology company that is not a fan. Hmm. All right, let's move on to retail. Walmart reporting a mixed quarter. The stock seems to be a victim of just being a retail name. Well, I think it's really a victim of having been the strongest of the retail names. And here, the uh, Doug McMillan really showed his prowess in this call. They, they've got the support of the, uh, of the family. Uh, and the family is basically saying, hey, listen, uh, you can spend as much money as you want to be competitive with Amazon. And, and that's, the only, that's the only company that can do that. Uh, I, I don't know if you got a chance to read the report, but Amazon is really in their crosshairs. That's mm. quite a difference from what we're used to. Oh, it's pretty incredible. Um, also, Alibaba e-commerce revenue up 58 well, percent. You know, I, I interviewed them last year at the Delivering Alpha conference for CNBC. This one's in September 12th this year, and uh, I had questions about it. A former writer of uh, for the Street, Herb Greenberg, raised some really good inquiries about the way they handle their accounting. I felt much better after it. The stock was at 90, as I said on CNBC and in a tweet this morning uh, to an ad, ad Adam Plotkin, who's a terrific, thoughtful uh, tw uh, tweeter, uh, AAP member, um, that I got it wrong. I, I, when I heard it, I should have just bought it for the trust. And sometimes that's going to happen. You got to own why. And when I go over in my mind about why we didn't pull the trigger, I keep coming back to that I was concerned about the China economy and not anything they were doing at BABA and not the accounting. And that turned out to be a suboptimal reason to not buy, an ill-advised reason to not buy the stock. Speaking of the China economy, Jim, what did you think of Steve Bannon's comments that we're in this economic war with China? Well, I, I think we are. I, I felt well before Bannon, uh, well before this president, well before Obama, uh, that our trading partners have been quite negligent. Matt Horween is my writing partner. I would, we spent a lot of time trying to analyze a trade deal that the United States got the better uh, side of, and there are none. Uh, and I really don't like the attack just on China, although I do as a new core shareholder from my trust, uh, suffering from, from China and from margin pressure. I you know, buy some new core fraction alerts because it's a great American company and we're willing to own it for a long time. But China doesn't play fair in a lot of different industries. Uh, South Korea doesn't play fair. I think that the European uh, Union doesn't play fair. I think that the Mexican currency, the currency is making so Mexico doesn't play fair. So the solo singling out of China, I think is not broad enough. Mm. And I think if you're going to be a fair trader, as I would like to be, you should be a little more aggressive than, than Bannon is in terms of 
going after the, say, South Korea, which we've always protected because of North Korea, but has been very bad on automobiles. Um, I think that you should really analyze the Mexican situation, which is taking a lot of business away. I've got uh, where I have a house in Mexico, they're building 500,000 cars a year. When I got the house, they weren't building any. So be a little more broad and recognize that it's our trading philosophy to have America lose. And that would be a more coherent schematic about what to go after. I often find that in this administration, they have a point of view that is articulated uh, in a way that is fiery, mm. but not subs as substantive as I would like. It's an important perspective. All right, Jim, shifting gears, I saw you mention Micron Technology and your stop trading. Yeah, segment. I did that because Kelly Kramer, um, the terrific CFO of, of Cisco, address why the gross margins weren't even better, and the gross margins were quite good for Cisco. And a lot of that is component cost, and the component is uh, DRAMs. Um, and she predicted that, that DRAMs maybe don't come down in price. There are a lot of people betting against Micron, and also their derivative LAM research, um, betting that, this, that it's peak, uh, that we are peak margins, and it's about, DRAM's about to roll over. I felt more strongly, a la what our fabulous Fibonacci queen, Carolyn Baroden, told us the other day that Micron may be an upstock. All right, Jim, we'll end as we always do with earnings to watch. We have three of them. We talked about retail earlier. What are you expecting from Foot Locker on Friday? Uh, Foot Locker, mall-based, uh, it's, it's been completely trashed. I go over what Dick said, and uh, Footwear was actually a standout with Dick's. Um, Foot Locker is, uh, I, what I prefer to do is say, okay, listen, if you like Foot Locker, please go buy, the stock is down, TJX, and read our, uh, I think, very authoritative analysis of why TJX is the best retailer to own right now. And that's on actionalertsplus.com. We also have uh, Estee Lauder. Estee Lauder, boy, Fabrizio Freire has done a remarkable job. Unfortunately, the stock has run up so much, it is indeed priced for perfection. But remember, Estee Lauder is maybe the ultimate selfie stock. Yes. Uh, people are trying to play JCPenney because of Sephora, but there's so much else that JCPenney is not working. Uh, I would let Estee, I would not buy Estee Lauder before the quarter because I don't know what he can possibly do to keep that price up, a la Walmart, which has ran up so much I didn't know what Doug McMillan could do to keep it up, which is why I said buy some before buy some after. I reiterate that I want to own Walmart uh, right here. Uh, I reiterate that after Estee Lauder comes down, it's a good stock because I've been recommending it since the 80s. All right. And then my last one is Deer. Yeah, look, the farm cycle is back. Um, there was a downgrade of Deer earlier this week. I prefer Agco. I think Agco is cheaper. Martin Rieschenhagen, a frequent guest on uh, Mad Money, bought a ton of stock back at much lower levels. Uh, Deer's remarkable company. It has run, the stock itself has run a great deal. I feel a little more confident with Agco here. Uh, well, you mentioned Mad Money guests. How about that interview with Joe Papa? Unbelievable. Well, you know, it, there are two ways to look at Joe Papa. You can look at the equity side and Wells Fargo once again was the leader in saying that the stock's too high. Many of the analysts had to slash their revenue number, but that was because he sold certain divisions. I thought that was short-sighted. Uh, the bonds are trading up. The bonds, the... Um, the fixed income side was what I was most worried about. In a remarkably short period of time, Joe Papa has uh, been able to pay down debt. He's been able to introduce some new drugs. He's been able to get some growth. So I have reevaluated, and I think that at these prices, which obviously is above nine, Valiant is a decent spec. Uh, uh, we own Allergan. It's been horrendous performer of late. Uh, I think that Allergan is now therefore cheaper. It's probably the cheapest big cap drug company in an environment where people hate Allergan because it owns a big stake in Teva and was unable to monetize it before Teva fell apart. I think Allergan is a better risk reward than value. All right, Jim Kramer, we'll leave it there. Thank you so Thank much you. as always for more information on the stocks in Jim's portfolio, head to actionalertsplus.com.